Um, and so the next speaker um, is Jim DiCarlo, who has thoughtfully given you all of his titles on his title slide, so we know who he is. Jim is uh, chair of the Department of Brain and Cognitive Science at MIT and is uh, well known for work that bridges the physiology and biology of object recognition and the use of deep neural networks to understand that biology. So without further ado, Jim. Okay. Good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me, Tony, and, and the organizers. I, I remember this is a conference in neuroscience and AI and what they can say to each other. So I'm going to try to give you an example of how that's worked for us, and hopefully it, either if you're not working in vision, it will still inspire something that you like to think about um, beyond vision. And again, the story in vision is not yet complete, but I'm going to tell you an overview of how we've put these things together so far and maybe how we're looking forward. So I titled my talk Reverse Engineering Human Visual Intelligence. That's just a provocative title. I'm not going to talk about all the visual intelligence, but I do want to kind of talk about this term reverse engineering. So what does that mean? So for me, what that means is we, as a group, have an, a goal really to account for each ability of the mind, which I'll broadly call intelligence. Um, using components of the brain, which for systems neuroscientists often means neurons and their connections. And we want to do this in the language of engineering, which means we're going to have math and computational models that can explain all this. Okay, that's really a kind of a statement of the problem, or which gets to an approach. As my colleague Josh Tenenbaum likes to say, is another way to put this is like, let's do science like engineers, or similarly, let's do engineers like scientists, right? So um, this is how what, what we've tried to do in our own lab. And um, when I, I want to sort of give you the most important slide first. Everything I'm going to show you is from these folks in my lab and collaborators, some of listed here, and especially work of Dan Yeamans, that, who's now at Stanford. And I'll, I'll try to highlight folks along the way. Okay, so reverse engineering, I sort of gave you a setup of, of what that means, but here's what it maybe means a little more concretely for us. So if you're going to work on a problem, some kind of visual problem, you have to specify it first. So define, operationalize a domain of interest. And usually this means something that brains do maybe better than us. Better could be in a, brains do better than machines. In a performance sense, it could mean in a power sense, could mean in a size. All of those things are senses of better. Um, and then you want to go and measure something in the system. So this is a natural science. You go and make measurements of the system of biology. And you want to choose those measurements wisely because there's lots of stuff you could measure in the brain, right? So you can measure behavior in spikes. That's what I'm going to show you. But you could measure anatomy, which is important as well. You could measure blood flow, neural perturbation, subcellular genetics. You could do all kinds of things within the brain. It's a, neuroscience is a big tent. So you need to choose wisely if you want to get constraints on, these kind of, on the thing that you've specified. But then you can't stop there. Um, that's just measurement. Then you have to actually go and build models. So you can think of this, or I like to think of this as forward engineering under the constraints of those brain measurements. So the model must, can't just be an, a kind of conceptual model. It has to actually capture all the measurements, and it must predict held out measurements. As Jan said, sort of if we're, if we, the essence of intelligence you could call prediction, and this is a, a meta version of that. If we as scientists are going to say that we have an understanding, we better be able to predict held out measurements from the system of interest. Now, in practice, what this means for most systems neuroscience is that we're going to be working with artificial neural networks. So because those have neurons, you, they may not be exactly like our neurons, but they have neurons that can be mapped to the brain. So that allows us to make predictions in the brain. And this often means because we're going to predict and not just have conceptual ideas, these models must often be built at scales that approach the scales of the problem, the complexity of the tasks that we're engaged with. So these are kind of components that you could call from ML, machine learning, AI broadly, that are critical to advancing our understanding of how the brain and the mind work. You don't just do this in a one-way loop and then end, of course, then you end up with a family of models that need to be better called by more measurements, build better models, more measurements. And the faster you can make this cycle go, I, I would posit that this leads to a model that will, uh, which we would call our kind of human understanding of the system that we set about to measure, at least over the domain that we specified. And you, again, this, you can think of this as the domain of science, which is its purview mostly lives here. And it's the domain currently of engineering, especially AI and ML with respect to the, the, this audience here. So what our goal is to really, as a field, is to pull these things tighter together. I think that's the point of this conference. I want to point out that if you work in this framework, the models you come up with are actually in the language of engineering. So they're not that far away from various applications of which many of you are interested in. And I don't just mean AI. 
Um, so um, this is in MIT embodied by our Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, and also a, an Intelligence Quest initiative launched at MIT, this blending or merging of science and engineering. So I'm going to tell you this sort of big picture idea of how we think about doing science uh, today about our problem, which we call human core visual object perception, or, or more, more, more um, precisely visual object recognition, and I'll show you that next. So many of you know our work, we know we work on, we want to understand visual scene comprehension or broadly visual intelligence. Um, we started way back when, and we've really been focused just on the problem of categorization, much like the history of computer vision. So just being able to be able to label the objects in the scene here. We take advantage of our knowledge that we know something about the primate retina uh, and the primate ventral visual stream that I'll show you in a minute. It really processes the central part of the image, say the central 10 degrees, which is meant to be illustrated here. And you don't take in the scene all at once and instantly understand it. You make samples around this scene where you dwell for a few hundred milliseconds, called um, uh, fixations, and you rapidly move your eyes to sample the scene. So what that brings to your ventral stream engine that I'll talk about in a minute is a series of snapshots, if you will, of the world that look like that. Now, I hope that you could notice that you could still recognize one or more objects in each and every one of those images, even though they're now kind of out of context and you didn't know what the sequence was, yet you can still do that quite well. And that problem is what we've been focused on. That's called core object recognition, central 10 degrees, first 200 milliseconds of viewing, task here, report object category of, say, a central foreground object. So essentially, almost all of what I'm going to tell you about today is about that problem, but we don't think that's the end of the game. That's just a way to get us a foothold on the problem of visual intelligence. This problem is hard. It was known to be hard from computer vision because um, objects like cars can produce an essentially infinite number of images, like this car here, due to things like pose size illumination, background clutter and occlusion, subordinate level variation. Um, but this is what makes the problem hard, and so we like to engage that. And the way we did this is by generating images where we often have a single rendered foreground object on a, a non-related but naturalistic background, and we can then generate a lot of images this way, you can kind of like this, and they might look like something out of a horror movie like this. So um, you can still quickly recognize that this is like a face or a head, even though this is, again, something you'd be unlikely to typically see. Um, these kind of images brought computer vision systems to their knees, yet you were easily able to do this. This was in 2008 or so. We could show we could crush all the computer vision systems just by that simple kind of image generation process. And so we, we use this. You, here's an example of you just showing that you can do it yourself. So OK, there was an image. And which, what did you see? I hope you noticed it was that. And I'm not even telling you what's coming up. I hope you noticed you saw a bird and not an elephant. OK, so you, that's just an operationalized version of what I introduced. And again, around 2009, here's machine performance at high object uncertainty, and here's human performance. It shows a little bit of fall off, but humans are much better than machines in 2009 at doing this problem. Okay, again, this space is, again, what we call core recognition. Okay, so back to reverse engineering. So here's primates. This is the one we all understand, the human primate. We want to understand ourselves. That's the mission here. And, um, well, but we want to go in, now we've got to measure. I said I measure a bunch of internal stuff, not just behavior, but let's do this reverse engineering approach. So here's where my lab takes advantage of the rhesus monkey system. Here's some rhesus monkeys shown here. One of the reasons we like to do this is that uh, these uh, organisms can easily do the same task that, that you were just doing. And here's an animal doing it in his home cage happily triggering a new image and then choosing which of the objects it saw in the image. Many, many dozens of interleaved object recognition tasks that are sort of randomly interleaved trial by trial. You get lots of behavioral data this way. And when you plot the behavioral data, this is just at one grain of resolution. Uh, this is for um, uh, one primate species and the other. And these are the difficulty patterns uh, in D prime units. Red means challenging, so tanks are often confused with trucks. And blue means it's sort of relatively easy to discriminate objects. So look, these patterns are not something that emerge out of pixel models or simple visual representations, yet both of these primate species produce these patterns. I'm not going to tell you which is which, because the main point is that you, we can't tell the difference here, that monkeys and humans, in terms of discriminating basic level objects, are statistically indistinguishable. Um, and that means for us, it gives us license to go in and start measuring the internal components to say, how do you actually accomplish this task? So now we're going to measure the primate system components in a rhesus monkey, and hopefully that gives us strong inference on human vision. OK, so decades of neuroscience has already provided us with lots of constraints on this problem. We know about the ventral visual processing stream that's critically important. For instance, lesions in the top of this stream called infratemporal cortex produce deficits in recognition um, in the, in the non-human primate. Um, and we like to lay this out as a series of kind of, this is just a kind of conceptual space of neurons here, millions of neurons in each area, where we know something about the feed-forward anatomy, the feedback anatomy, and the recurrent anatomy. They're just roughly illustrated just schematically with these arrows here. 
Um, we also know a lot about the physiology, and again, this is all work well before my lab even started. We know a lot about the physiology of the ventral visual stream. We know, for instance, that there's a retinotopic map, of course, on the back of the retina here in the retinal ganglion cells, and then co continuing retinotopic maps all along here. We know that there's local processing, which is tiled across the visual field, and much more that we know that I'll mention a bit more later. Okay, so we know a lot about this system, and, um, but what we think's going on for a question like the one I showed you of being able to do core recognition is that when an image comes up like this, when it, your, your brain just captures an image at the back of the retina, it rapidly transforms this, and I'll say an approximately first feed-forward pass, just approximately, again, this is a schematic, to a new population pattern of activity in IT cortex here, which is illustrated by these d red dots. So you, this image evokes this pattern, new image evokes a new pattern, and these patterns in IT that are not photographs, but some transformed versions of the input pattern, the input pixel pattern, can follow along in your IT with a lag of about 150 milliseconds as you watch this video here. And we think those, that ability is what underlies, these patterns underlie your ability to do the thing I showed you at the beginning, to say, I saw a person, I saw a sign, I saw Yoda. Okay, so um, these, um, uh, if you want to now get into the physiology, we uh, go in and record the spikes in a monkey, and this is just to show those of you who are not used to neural data on um, what this looks like. So each action, each line here is an action potential recorded in an IT neuron in a monkey in response to four different images. And these, these rows are different repeated trials, and this is just to give you a feel for the most elemental data that we are trying to measure and, and try to predict. So these are different IT sites respond, as you can see, to different images. And I want to really draw here you to the point of the way we think about analyzing this data on first pass, which is just to average over the trial reps and average often across a time window. Those parameters, especially the timing parameters, are very interesting to us. But for now, I'm just going to tell you, just think about this as averaging these little spiking times into one number. So you're getting one number out of each of these images for this particular IT site. And um, that's just an example neuron in IT for four images, one example neuron. So um, uh, with work of my colleagues, some of whom are in this room, we scaled up our ability to record from the monkey with array recordings, um, often now multiple arrays implanted simultaneously in the animal uh, to record while they're doing awake behaving a performance of tasks or just visual fixation. And this allowed us to dramatically increase the amount of data, both images and channels that we can get uh, per day. And again, this started a, a, almost uh, 10 years ago now. So when we take those data and analyze them in the way I just showed you, where we count spikes, again, this is just a first pass of the data. You can just think of now, here's a bunch of recorded IT neurons. And typically now our pools of neurons are hundreds in each animal and thousands if we pool monkeys together. So these are IT neurons here, and there's a response like I showed you earlier. Now we're looking at a population of neurons, not one neuron, in response to one image. So you're seeing you know, three spikes, 12 spikes, and the, the, the amount of response is just indicated here by color. Okay, this is just to, again, orient you to the data. So notice, um, this is just one image. Of course, we collect many images. Here's eight images before I showed you four, and these are now these complex images that I showed you at the beginning. Um, so we don't just collect eight, but these methods allow us to collect thousands of images, so we end up with these very large data volumes that look like this that we can use to then constrain our modeling efforts. So that's give you a feel for the data. We also, for the aficionados, point out that we measure these at very high resolution, so 50, 50 high signal to noise, so 50 repetitions each to get a sense of what this neuron really responds to on average for each image. Okay, so there's those kind of, that's the kind of data that we get. And then remember those behavioral data that I showed you that both primates have, us and this primate, that's shown here. And one of the things that we showed over the last decade, and we are these folks here at most recent work, is that you can take simple linear decoders, train them up on a bit of data, and accurately predict the performance on held out images and reduce these behavioral patterns. So in this sense, this is already one turn of that re reverse engineering cycle that you can predict things, you can build a model that predicts that. The bottom line is this is a powerful set of features here, just a linear transform needed to actually produce the behavioral performance that we see in both animals. The specific parameters of that transform are, of course, interesting to neuroscience, and they're important in lots of ways, and you think about things like BMI, but I'm not going to talk about them today. But those details matter more than just saying IT explains behavior. So what I want to talk about now is that the IT feature set, you can think of it as the penultimate product of the brain's algorithm for core recognition. The ultimate product is, of course, the delivery of the behavior. But so you can think of this as very close to being sufficient, basically computationally, to support the behavior. So that's then a setup to ask for us the kind of harder questions in a way, which is how are these features evolved, developed, learned to reach this powerful adult endpoint that relates to the talk you just heard from Jan?
Do direct perturbations of these individual neurons cause perceptual changes that are predicted by these models? That's, these are ongoing lines of questions for us, neither of which I'm going to tell you about today. What I will tell you about is this very important question, which we've been working on for the last decade, which is how do the IT features computed from the image? Similarly, what are the intermediate features along the ventral stream? These are essentially the same question. OK, and I'm going to just give you a, again, an overview tour of that work. So what we did is not just measure things about IT, like that big block of data I just showed you, but now let's build some models under those constraints. OK, so the models that I'm going to show you, they take as their input not this whole image and then try to do the task. That's something that we and our collaborators are working on next. For now, just think of these models as taking an image like this one and processing it to something that's sufficient to support recognition. So again, four by four degrees, roughly central 10 degrees. Um, and these models, they don't just come out of the blue. They were inspired, again, by decades of neuroscience work that I've alluded to already. Some of the key items that turn out to be important are listed here from neuroscience. And again, this is not our lab's work. This is decades of work prior to us. This led to a series of models, the first Fukushima in 1980, a first kind of, kind of convolutional neural network that implemented some of these ideas in the context of doing visual recognition. Uh, Tommy Poggio worked on this in the HMAX class of models. Um, my lab worked on this in a sort of extended class doing sort of GPU search through this model space. And this was with Dave Cox and Nicholas Pinto. And then I want to tell you about a model family that we worked on that was driven by Dan Yeamans and a, a postdoc at the time in the lab and Ha Hung, a graduate student. We call this model HMO, but it doesn't matter. The specifics don't matter. It's the general ideas that came from this that I hope that you will remember. OK, so um, HMO was a model that was built by us to try to just say, hey, let's kind of use those constraints. So we got these like layers within the visual system, V1, V2, V4, IT. Um, and those are already inspired by neuroscience. So we were happy to be working with so-called deep networks because we were looking at a deep network. And we knew from the uh, work of, of many people, again, that there were different filter types in V1, which are illustrated here by these four planes. Those are, these are supposed to be sheets of simulated artificial neurons. Uh, they don't show you the individual neurons. So think of these four types as four types of filters, like four types of orientations. And um, this, these, these neurons in here, they're not, they're not just kind of pulled out of the blue. Again, you, they're doing linear operations with some nonlinearity and often with some normalization gain control. And again, these were ideas that already existed. Again, many of the folks in this room, um, Matteo and David and also um, Tony Mobshin and others kind of inspired these ideas. And those are implemented in here as well. So really, we're just putting into the basket here things that we roughly thought were true based on the data that others had already obtained. Um, and then we apply these kind of models to try to solve the task I showed you, which is to be able to recognize objects across transformations. So we did this by generating objects um, under transformations, placing them on random backgrounds, as I showed you earlier, and try to sort of get a system to solve that task. Now, how do we get the system to try to solve that task? We have architectural constraints here. Again, here only essentially feed forward with a little bit of feedback, architectural constraints. And then we use something that I think is completely, um, well, maybe Yashua's in the room, so I don't know if I should say it too strongly, but this is not what we thought of as biological. So um, we just used applied math and computer science tricks to tune the parameters. For us, they were hyperparameter tuning. Now, more recently, gradient descent, which is the more common way to train these so-called deep networks. I don't, like, I don't want to dwell on this other than say, use engineering to get this model family down to a specific model that can perform this task. We're not fitting any neurons when we do this. We're just optimizing within an architectural space. When you do this, what's really remarkable is that you can then go ahead and compare these artificial neurons to the actual neurons we record in the brain. And what we find when we compare, first of all, I want to say it's not like I expect an individual IT neuron to pop out here that's going to match an IT neuron here. We ask, can individual IT neurons fit in a, in a set, on a basis set, where there's a regression from these artificial neurons onto this neuron, as if, uh, um, uh, uh, so, that, so that this just lives in the spanning space of this here. And we can, of course, compare each of these. We can ask, does V1 fit IT, does V2 fit IT, and so forth. Of course, we do all that. Um, but so here's what you find is that, again, you get this remarkable ability to predict these complicated responses in IT. So here's one of these IT neurons that we had previously recorded. Um, this is its response now to those thousands of images that I'm showing you here. And um, you, I've grouped them by category. This is not time. I hope you can see this at the bottom. Um, these are just images of animals, bows, chairs. And here's some example images of chairs here. So this is the category chairs. And you could roughly call this a chair neuron, but the structure of the neuron is much more interesting in its response than just saying it's a chair neuron. 
But what's remarkable is that here's the red line prediction from that, this is the HMO model, a regress to predict these images. It's never seen these images, it's never even seen these objects, yet it can make this prediction of what this neuron's going to do for these images. And this was actually quite remarkable to us that with this procedure, we could get things that could predict quite well. Here's a so-called face neuron. It kind of responds on average more to faces. Here's some face examples. Um, but you can see it's more interesting than just calling it a face neuron. Something else is going on that's more subtle. And you can see it predicts it again quite well. Okay, so overall, this was what was impressive to us is that you just kind of had these models that would um, produce a very high explained variance. So, uh, you know, about 50% of the explainable variance explained by these models. And here's a V4 neuron. It looks even more complicated. You can't call it a chair or a face neuron. It has these crazy responses in response to many images, some examples shown here. Remember, V4 is the input to IT. Um, and here's the model predictions in red out of different layers. And I hope you can kind of see that this middle layer three actually provides the best predictor of this V4 neuron. Again, remember, we did not optimize for V4 or IT. We just were trying to optimize within a space to explain it, to, 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 to produce the, the task that we had picked out. Again, high explained variance of these kind of models. These are all predictions I want to stress of mid-level neurons. They're not data fits to these neurons, okay? And also, um, these networks, I've often heard people say that, oh, you have this network, it predicts stuff, but it's just a black box. This is the furthest thing from a black box I can imagine because um, we know everything about it, we built it, we can map its internals. I understand the goal of trying to appreciate it. There's simpler versions of this, and I think Arrow will probably talk about that, but it is certainly not a black box. Um, I want to also highlight here that we're doing this in IT, but others have done this um, more recently in, in things like fMRI, especially Nikos Krigas Gorte, Ode Olivia, Jack Galante, and, and Jatandra Malik, Justin Gardner. These are just examples of people who have used this comparative approach between training these networks and comparing them here often at the level of fMRI. There's a meta lesson here that I think is the, one of the most important things that you should take from this if you don't remember anything about V4 and IT. And, that, and this is, I think, the most important thing for this conference here, is that if you think about performance of these models. What we did here is we noticed that as you had models that were higher performing, so this is performing on a recognition task, and this is our ability to predict something neuroscientists care about. In this case, it's IT prediction explained variants. But you have, this is a family of models. These are deep neural networks. They're sampled off the deep CNN family. Here were some older examples. And what we had done, the way we think about it is, in, you know, roughly when we did this work in around 2012 and that model I showed you, we kind of were able to get a model to do better using those engineering tricks. And so that moved us in the performance axis and also moved us in the explained variance axis. So there's this correlation that was continuing between performance of models and the ability to explain the internals, the so-called hidden units of the brain. So again, a computer vision goal sort of driving a neuroscience goal. And, and I think that's a very interesting intersection of our field. It makes you wonder, as a neuroscientist, can we just sort of sit back and say, OK, now we have these models we're developing. You know, we'll just wait for computer vision. They'll just kind of give us better models, and we'll just wait, and then they'll have models of the brain, and we don't have to do anything else. Right? So um, that's not probably going to work, but let me give you a sense of it kind of works a little bit. So AlexNet, this model came out right around the time we were doing this work, um, and it kind of took over computer vision. Right? So it is, this assumed now this was computer vision working in parallel. They weren't trying to explain the brain, yet they had a model that started winning the ImageNet competition, and now DeepCNNs took over computer vision, as you've heard from many others. And then beyond vision, then deep networks took over and, and with folks like Yashu and Jan and others, they can apply these things for all kinds of things. And so um, there's this whole deep learning revolution. But just coming back to these visual models, so here's that plot I showed you earlier. This is computer vision um, performance, now image net performance. And, and this is uh, that neuroscience goal, fit IT, that I showed you earlier. This is kind of like those blue dots I showed you a minute ago. Here was the model we had in 2012. Don't worry about the units here, but that was the level we were at. These were models we later developed in our lab. But at 2012, actually, this model was even better at fitting IT than our own model was. And they had, this model was better at ImageNet, too. So it kind of continued that same kind of trend. And you see that trend continued here, that doing better here leads to better predictive power here. Maybe not at ceiling yet. That's an interesting discussion point. But then we look forward, keep watching what's going on with these models, and I'm like, this cannot continue forever. And this is actually what we're observing, is sort of as these models are getting deeper and deeper and deeper, they're doing better and better and better, but they're not fitting IT necessarily better. If anything, they may be sort of drifting away from explaining what's going on in the brain. OK, that's, again, there's clues in these models that are still helpful. I don't want to imply they're not useful, but that's kind of what you see if you look at this at the first glimpse.
one of these things these models did accomplish is they, not, they were able to sort of explain something that I showed you before was hard for models to explain, which is the behavioral patterns and performance at this grain of object resolution that I showed you a minute ago. In fact, here's the humans, the monkeys. Remember, I said they were the same. Here's the deep CNN. This happens to be Inception. They're all, they're all Inception V3. They're all very similar to each other. So they had achieved this kind of benchmark here. Um, Interestingly, you think about these models, and this is, this is just very recent work, I'll just flash up at you, is that um, you should be able to use these models to actually drive the neurons better. You should be able to do stuff with them beyond saying they fit things. And um, this is using synthesis tricks. This is related to things that you may hear about from Arrow. So here we're synthesizing best stimuli for these different neurons here. This happens to be in V4, and these are the folks that did the work. And again, this is ongoing work. It's kind of cool that you've seen the synthesis procedures, but you get these kind of different things for different neurons. And if you kind of repeat with new seeds, you see these kind of visually look very similar to that. But remember, our goal was to see, can we actually drive this neuron better than we'd ever seen it drive before? And so here was the response of this neuron for a bunch of those images I showed you. Remember, I said the models are predicting quite well, and that's this correlation here. Um, but what was kind of cool is that we, these, these predicted things that drive it were actually way up near the, the sort of high end of the response. So at least to first order, these kind of synthesized things are sort of suggesting these models are really onto something and that they can even predict things that are, drive the neuron stronger. I want to point out, this is just one example neuron. This is preliminary work. None of this is published yet. This is ongoing work in the lab. OK, so a summary of what I was sort of told you is that we now have many decent, maybe say sufficient, models of the ventral stream processing, not the learning. You've heard about that from others. And one of the ventral stream's key supported behavior, core recognition. So what do we do now? So I have, I think, five minutes now. So I'm going to tell you what we've been doing the last uh, recently. So um, you go back, get some more data. Um, here's Coheed's car. We're measuring more and more images, even computer vision images. And um, we scale up our behavioral testing. So we're kind of in adversarial mode. We view our job as like we're going to beat up on these models and show how they differ from the brain. And that's going to drive the next generation of brain-like models. So we get a lot of behavioral data. We try to get a lot of neural data. Um, here's just looking at the behavioral data. Now at the image grain resolution, this is image by image. I don't worry about the details other than to say, look, humans and monkeys still look very, very similar to eyeball, you can see here. Here's a deep CNN. It starts to, even though I showed you it was passing our behavioral test, it's starting to fail on these kind of comparisons here. And that's quantified here, that all of these deep CNNs, they're now failing at this higher stringency comparisons of primates. So these circuits are doing something. The brain is doing something that these models are not yet doing, even on these visual recognition tasks. And these, bra these brain circuits are outperforming for many of these images. Each dot is an image. Um, these, uh, so each dot is an image. This is performance for computer vision and, 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 and primates. And these are images where the computer vision image systems, like AlexNet and others, they don't get these images right, yet the monkeys and humans get them right. Um, and these are images where both species get them right. And so we can compare these. Um, we can call these discovered adversarial images. Um, these are the examples of some of them. There's nothing obvious that separates one from the other, except that computer vision is failing and primates get these all right easily. Um, so um, one of the things that I want to show you that we've done just briefly is that when you go in and you can kind of look in the brain to say what differs between how the brain processes these computer vision yet unsolved images and these computer vision, let's call them solved, indicated by these two colors here, we go and do our usual trick and record in the ventral visual stream, go record a bunch of neurons, record the population, and ask, can we decode what's going on out of IT? It's not obvious that the brain and the level of IT and the monkey will actually solve these hard images. Um, but when we go and measure the decoders, so here's what we see. Um, the decoders come and they actually go, OK, this is a decoder as a function of time. This is monkey level accuracy. This image comes in and the decodes just fine um, at this time point here. And here comes another one of these easy images. OK, just fine. OK, computer vision's fine on these. No problem. It fits what I told you earlier. Brain decodes it in IT. OK, but now here's one of these hard images. You get this quite right, just as accurate as the others I just showed you. You report this as a car if you were to do this task. And the brain, what does it do? Well, it decodes it, but it takes it a little bit longer, on the order of 30 milliseconds on average to just decode this image. But it reaches the level of performance in IT. So your brain rattles around a little bit longer subconsciously, yet you get this done. Here's a foreshortened image of a dog. Same thing, you get it done a little bit later. Notice IT neurons are responding here. It's not as if things aren't responding. It's just the information hasn't kind of become fully explicit with regard to the category. Here's a bunch of these images. We tested thousands. Here's a few examples. I want you to see the blue and the red and that they're shifted from each other. So these images are solved by the ventral visual stream, which makes sense given the behavior. Um, but they take about 30 milliseconds longer to solve them. And similarly, it's interesting that those deep nets that I showed you predicting IT neurons, they predict 
best at the front part of the response of IT, and this is now a function of time, and their ability to predict IT neurons, and they predict worse and worse the further you look in the response. And I'm not talking seconds later, just 30 milliseconds later. Okay, so these are all consistent with the idea that feedback and recurrent circuits are needed. Not only are they needed to better explain the brain and its dynamics, but also they're performance critical, uh, as shown at the examples I've shown here. So um, let me just sort of, sort of end by saying, of course, we want to go back and sort of model this better. We've only really modeled, as I alluded to earlier, essentially the feed-forward aspect of the brain. Of course, somebody mentioned in the last question that there's feedback that's not often incorporated in these models, and I know many people are interested in this. We and our collaborators are trying to build these models guided by the kinds of data that I just showed you, as well as performance data. And we think if we incorporate these kind of connections correctly, we'll get performance out of these systems relative to even current computer vision systems. But even if we don't, we're going to better understand how the brain works. Okay, so I'm going to just sort of end with a big picture that, you know, at MIT, and I think broadly with this coalition, the way we're thinking about this is that science and engineering um, have something to offer as we're building models that contain parts of neural elements, essentially neural networks. Science can offer its discoveries. These are hypotheses for us. Um, engineering is really good at doing this, and these are um, also al alternative intelligence systems for them. So this is an exciting time right now for both of these fields, and I think this is broadly AI, machine learning, and engineering as we described it earlier. And remind you, you've heard from others, I'm talking about core recognition. This is just scratching the surface of what we might call broadly human intelligence. And maybe my last slide, if Tony will allow me, is that, you know, we're talking about neuroscience, the brain, and how it's going to relate into AI. Um, but remember, a science and engineering-based approach, an engineering understanding of the brain has opportunities to transform human education, ameliorate brain disorders. These are not things we talked about this conference, and really to just understand ourselves. It's the greatest question of humankind. If we can do it in engineering terms, it will be a, the um, a most amazing journey for us to all be on, and I hope you join. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Let's see, there are two questions on the aisle over there, if I could get mics over there. Uh, in front and behind, Dick, I saw you. Um, and um, let's start over there. I have two quick questions. Uh, so first, uh, yesterday we heard from uh, Sandy Han here oh. um, that uh, the global neuronal workspace theory predicts that the prefrontal cortex is crucial for conscious awareness. So from your talk, it seems that core visual object recognition, which is presumably conscious, can be solved by the ventral stream alone. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. And second quick question is that the deep network is fed to neural data averaged across 50 repetitions. So presumably there is a lot of trial-to-trial -trial variability in the neural data. Uh, is this something that, uh, that is worth considering? Yes, yeah, so there's two different questions there. So the trial by trial variability, I mentioned I averaged that, and it's a great question. We average it because we're trying to think of these as sort of feature processors, and we want to know their average encoding in the image space, and that's why we do it. Um, there are important questions of when I, how many neurons you need given the variability to actually complete the task, and we've addressed those in the papers. You need, you know, on the orders of 50,000 neurons for linear decodes, and I, I didn't, those are details that you'll find in the papers. Um, Others are using the variability to try to get inference on the circuits, They're looking at the trial by trial variability and how the animal will perform. That's not something we've been doing here. I think they're ultimately trying to get to the same thing, which is the relationship between the neural activity and the perception, or at least the behavior. These are just different approaches to the same question. We prefer to do it in this sort of high SNR regime because we care about image space in the sense that machine learning people care about image space more than the sort of detailed noise about the system. Although the brain has to worry about the trial by trial variability, and it's not necessarily noise. That's another debate in the field. Okay, that was your first question. The other one about consciousness, I, I don't even really know if I can touch that question. I'm an engineer, so I sort of define what are the behavioral outputs, what can I measure, can I build models to link them? So to the extent you will give me behavioral measurements that you would call awareness, um, then models better predict them, and, you know, but they're going to be behavioral reports of some kind. And if, the model, if, you, if, if we could talk offline about what kind of reports you think should be predicted to satisfy that criteria. And of course, even prefrontal, I showed him, I don't want to say prefrontal is not involved. I mean, that I say, briefly flashed up the notion of recurrence. I don't mean the recurrence has to be even in the ventral stream. It could be prefrontal to IT recurrence to support that. Again, I wouldn't call that awareness, but just in the context of the task that I was showing you, those are the kind of things that we're after now. If we cool prefrontal, does it affect these kind of decodes that are laid on IT? Those are the ongoing experiments. So I hope that sort of gets you a question answered. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, so 
from what I understood, you said for the adversarial example, the brain or IT cortex reaches its solution state at about 30 milliseconds later. Does that also translate into behavioral output? Is the reaction time of the monkey about 30 milliseconds? Yes, great question. So does the, if the IT takes 30 milliseconds longer to produce it, if you believe the decoding model I imply that IT then supports the behavior, it should show up in the latency of the reaction time, right? And I, I want to, that is, the quick answer is yes, that is true on average. And the, you could, you know, we, we, I didn't show you those slides, but it is true. Um, so even though I say humans saw those images, you could say, well, they don't solve them quite as quickly, um, just behaviorally observed. I want to also point out that that's an on average statement that I'm making, the 30 milliseconds, right? There's there's, as you saw in the data, there's a lot of overlap. Some of those CV images are still solved quickly by the brain. And we think those detailed data on which images are solved fast, which are solved slow, which are in our data, that's actually the value of constraining the models, not telling you, the modeler, that you need feedback and you should solve these images later. Because modelers already know that. I mean, you heard several of them come up and say that, right? What we uh, neuroscientists have to provide is high dimensional constraint data that's harder for them to fit. And so I didn't talk about there, but I'm sort of, you've given me the opportunity to say that now. Dick. So let's try to close the loop with Jan's talk and just focus on that 30 millisecond delay. It's one thing to show that it takes 30 milliseconds longer. It's another thing to show why it takes 30 milliseconds longer, whether it's due to recurrence or not, and the difference between the models. Uh, how do you do that in theoretical space? And how do you do that in actual uh, biological space? Right, okay, another great question. So this is, that's actually a question that's a little easier to address than the theory space. So what it means in the theory space for us is you build models with various ideas of recurrence and see if you might explain the results in the way I was just describing. Not just can you solve those images, but do you see the same kind of uh, delays per image that you observe in the data. So that's essentially hunting in the hypothesis space of various model types, hopefully inspired by some of the ideas that you're hearing from others in engineering and ML to constrain that a bit as well. So that's sort of coming but at it from one. But just because the AI system catches up on the 30 milliseconds doesn't mean that it's doing the same way that the human brain does. Yes. Yeah, so you might not care about that. You might be just trying to build a better mousetrap. No, well, but no, you, I think- you do I, care about it. I care about, care about I care about both, but I think we should you know, admit in the, you, that's why I said at the beginning, neuroscience is a big tent. I care about the spikes. At some point, you know, I'm glad somebody cares about the channels. I, I'd probably go on to a different problem. So they're important to certain things. I mentioned brain disorders at the end, but what we each care about is a little bit, at what level of predictive power are we gaining? So if I can't fit the spikes, then I'll say there's still a problem here for us at the level. And that's kind of what a monkey tool is best for measure. But we are, from the biology point of view, trying to silence those people. We're trying to use basically viral and dreads tricks to silence the connections, the feedback connections specifically to see if we can sort of gain traction on are those feedback circuits critical in the biology sense in the monkey. But still, our measure will be, are we predicting the spikes in the behavior better as we develop the models? Like those are our units of prediction that we aim for because we can't touch things like the channels or other lower things that you or others might be interested in. Does that I care about the channels today? And I mean, I'm talking about at the higher level of systems organization of V1 to IT and which layer and which recurrence and general principles. Nothing about, forget about the, the, the biophysics. We don't care about that today. Yeah, okay. Well, some people care about it. I don't know, they may not be in this room, but the notion of principles is a very long discussion and I think, um, I think, I don't think I could answer it right now. I hope for some principles. But short of principles, I want to predict the model, and what I want to predict is the spikes all along the ventral stream at all time points. And hopefully that can be done with principles, and I think Arrow's talk will kind of speak to that. But there's, just to be clear, there's no guarantee there. There is a guarantee that humans can build a model of this system. I think that will happen. Whether we'll have human digestible principles is still to be determined. Yeah. Back by the door. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It's very impressive work and very inspiring. My, my question is pretty related to the previous one. I was wondering whether you looked at or you tried to fit these models to predict uh, oscillations, local flow potentials, sequences of uh, spikes as opposed to just spike rates at a given instant, given that we've seen over the years that these may constitute important codes for, for computations and for processing in general. Um, we haven't done much in terms of predicting things like, you know, LFPs and others. I, I know there are other groups working on that, using these deep networks to, to do that, and are having similar success. Um, 
Uh, as you saw, I mean, this is a very fast thing. We don't think there's time for slow frequency oscillations to be mattering much in this behavior, but you know, we, so we, we're just not really, that's not what we've been focused on. But I think, I hope you take the general approaches of building models to predict the things of interest could be done. Again, that's just not our measurement of prime interest in the moment. So similar to the last question. Yeah. Um, Tony, so, you cut me off whenever. Hmm? You I, tell me when to end. I don't know if people's hands I are. I will tell you when to end. If uh, there are no more, Esther. One more here. One question is whether the recurrence is back to the hippocampus. When you look at these images, have I seen this one before? Have I seen this place before? And rather than refreshing the current image, you may be comparing that instant with the previous one. and maybe even have your subjects put a name on what they're seeing. So maybe, maybe not saying it, but if you're a subject in the experiment, might you not be labeling them as you, as you look at each image? Well, our subjects are monkeys, so they, they can't really say, but they, we, they get, they're given iconic choices, I, as I showed you at the beginning, to just point to the dog or the cat or whatever they think they saw, it's a transformed version. So I can't get them to say things, but you know, could things, could, could it be related to loops through the hippocampus? I certainly, could be subcortical, right? All we're saying is that there's a time lag, right? So on, on that decode out of IT. So we have an observation, but we don't really know the circuit details to explain it yet. And that relates to the last question. And hippocampus, probably more than, I don't think it's probably one place, right? It's an observation. We need to extend our networks in multiple ways to try to fit that observation. And our job is to make it hard for modelers to fit it and we're some of those modelers, but others are as well. That's on, on the experimental side. So it's a great suggestion. I just wish I could tell you more, but maybe in a couple years. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Okay.